best. All right. We're alive. Hey, everyone. We're going to, folks are logging in, so we'll give folks a few minutes to, to get on, and then we will get started. We'll just go ahead and start in a couple of minutes. Yeah, that's what I was going to. Because I, I do a, an overview at the beginning. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've got a, um, a good group here. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to our um, shelter series event. My name is Clarissa Goodlett, and I'm the communications director at Preservation North Carolina. Um, during this time when sheltering has become central to our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you and explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. Um, this is the second of our shelter series events um, that are scheduled for this year, and registration and information about the other events is available at preservationnc.org. So you can register for our um, upcoming uh, webinar events. And this afternoon, we're excited to present uh, Preservation NC Before and After, sponsored by Mike and Mary Cockrell. And our presenter is our own intrepid leader, Myrick Howard. And um, before I turn it over to Myrick, I just wanted to go over a few um, quick webinar uh, FYIs in case um, some of you are new to the platform. So I'm gonna do a share screen here. Let's see here. All right, um, so as you can probably tell, everybody is muted except for myself and Myrick. Um, we can't hear or see you, but we know you're there. And so we really appreciate you all coming. Um, we're recording the webinar and it will be available later on our digital channels, on our, on our website, on social media, um, and on our YouTube channel. And we're also live streaming it on Facebook. If you're having any technical issues, if you'll please utilize the chat function um, and we'll do our best to assist you and we're happy to crowdsource solutions. So if you see um, something in the chat and you know how to fix it, uh, feel free to respond to that person. Um, so when uh, Myrick was finished with the presentation, we will have a Q&A and I'll be moderating um, those questions. So you can ask questions in a couple of different ways. Um, so there is a Q&A button um, down at the bottom of your screen. So you can click on that and then type in your question. You can ask that anonymously or you can uh, put your name there. If you uh, put your name there, then I'll, I'll say who asked the question. Um, you can also raise your hand to ask a question. And if you can just wait till the end to, um, before you start to raise your hand, and then I'll unmute you and you can ask your question live. And um, also you can put questions in the chat as well. It's easier for us to moderate them if you ask um, in the Q&A part or raising your hand, but the chat is, is fine too. Um, we'll have a quick survey at the end um, that should appear a link to it once you exit the webinar. If you guys will take a few minutes um, to complete that, that's super helpful for us. Um, moving forward with what we need to do better, what we're doing well with, ideas for um, speakers, that kind of thing. So it's just um, a few questions. If you can do that, we certainly appreciate it. And we wanted to try to integrate a little bit of socializing. I know people are obviously wanting to connect and network. Um, the webinar format doesn't um, always provide for that opportunity in the best way. So we thought we might try to do a little after party um, after this webinar. And so if you want to join us for that for a few minutes, we'd love to have you. Um, the link to that um, Zoom meeting is down here in the bottom in red. 
and I've also posted it in the in the chat. So when this is over, Myrick and I will switch over to that meeting to to party. All right, <laughs> uh, that's all I have. And down at the bottom is the um, what you all should have as attendees for the um, uh, webinar. So those are the buttons that I was talking about. The chat, raise your hand, and uh, Q and A. And now I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark. And I'll start sharing. <laughs> okay. Um, is it on? Is on screen? Okay. Okay. Um, hello all, I'm Myra Howard. I'm with Preservation North Carolina. Um, soon going to be coming up on my 42nd anniversary with the organization. And this, this program started out as my favorite before and afters, but sort of morphed into more like my favorite recent photographs. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But I want to tell you a little bit about what we do with our, our properties work and how we got to where we are. Our organization back, dates back to 1939, and no, I was not the executive director in 1939. Um, and what we're best known for is the property work. Um, we, we work very explicitly to protect and promote buildings, landscapes, and sites uh, in North Carolina. But to put it in context, there are more than 75,000 properties on the National Register in North Carolina that's counting individual li listings and, or contributing to districts. Uh, there are more than 100 local commissions, and we've done close to 900 properties. So, um, yeah, that's one out of every 75. But our, our niche is, is very specific, dealing with endangered properties. And I, I'll show you that as we, we go through this. Um, we've been involved in advocacy. One of our most important things was dealing uh, was getting tax credits set up for the state of North Carolina, and those tax credits have resulted in total investment of more than three billion dollars. Who knew? We had no idea of that. Um, interesting to note that the initial impetus for the regular tax credits was our work in Edenton. Uh, it happened that the president of pro tem of the Senate, uh, this was part of this district and we took advantage of that. Uh, the impetus for the mills tax credit was Loray Mill in Gastonia and there we had the Senate finance chair from Gastonia and we uh, were again opportunistic to uh, get those in place and we've seen three billion dollars of investment. So we think saving endangered property is really about real estate. It's, a, it's very fundamentally uh, a real estate issue when a building is endangered. Um, you really have to figure out ownership, uh, issues with uh, the land, the zoning, uh, the condition of the property, all of those things are very specific to real estate. So we, for years, have said real estate is the name of the game for Preservation North Carolina. Um, don't worry, I'm going to show you photographs in a moment. Um, and in a nutshell, what we, the, the typical way you think of a revolving fund is you buy, you sell, you buy, you sell. Uh, and when you sell, you sell it with protective covenants that, that uh, put limits on uh, the property owners and future property owners, all future property owners related to demolition, alterations of certain kind. And um, there are sometimes affirmative requirements of uh, renovation if the property is not in good shape. And so it's just kind of you use the money over and over again, theoretically. It really doesn't exactly work that way, but that's the concept. So what I've found through the years, our best analogy is we're the animal shelter for historic properties. Uh, you know, we, we often give names to our, our dogs and our kitty cats that we're working with um, and attributions, you know, three-legged dog or a three-legged dog with mange, a three-legged blind dog, that's when it's really in trouble. And when they're really in trouble, they're running out in the middle of the interstate. Uh, and uh, we try to save these buildings, put them into somebody else's hands, 
and let them take care of it. And I'll tell you more about um, George or Snoopy, depending on how you want, what you want to call them, our new mascot that is now uh, our friend and uh, shows that we are the animal shelter. More on that later. What we're looking for when we're looking for properties, is it endangered? Vacancy is definitely an endangered property. Um, is it significant? Uh, usually that means is it eligible for the National Register? Uh, can we acquire it? If we can't acquire it, there may not be that much we can do about it. Can it be sold? And as you'll see from the photographs, our idea of what can be sold and a realtor's idea, typical realtor's idea of what can be sold is uh, two different things. Um, I remember some years ago when uh, we were advertising a property and the, the, uh, one of the people called and said, oh, tell me about the appliances that are in the kitchen and we're kind of going, uh, well, there's neither running water nor electricity. So you can put any kind of appliances in that you want. <laughs> um, and then do we have local support? Uh, without local support to help us, you know, keep the grass cutting the, 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 you know, doors locked or, or boarded up, um, we sometimes find it really hard to work with a property. But let's start with, with images. Now, the first couple of images people may have seen, uh, if they've seen our work, Bingham School was our first property um, in Orange County. It was actually before I started work with the organization. Uh, the, the revolving fund got its tax exempt status in 1977, and I started working in 1978 on a part time basis. Um, and this was an important property in Orange County, sitting vacant for years. This was very typical for us as a um, rural vacant property. At that point, nobody thought there was a market for these things. Uh, so we were kind of creating a market as we were going along and finding buyers and the buyers doing great renovations of these houses. And they are, for the most part, still in good shape. For the most part, they're still very much in use. Um, in fact, when I say for the most part, there's always one out there that's a problem, always one. But uh, Bingham School is our first. And one of my very first, first week on the job, I went up to Warrington uh, and, and looked at Shady Oaks, which this is a 1930s photograph by Francis Benjamin Johnston, uh, who photographed many of the more um, then thought of as important, the early houses of North Carolina. And even though this looks like a plain property on the outside, it had just splendid interior woodwork. Now, I'm going to be showing you some graining and marbleizing, as, as in wood that's painted to look like a different kind of wood and wood that's painted to look like marble. And you can see from this 1930s photograph that Shady Oaks uh, had graining and marbleizing. That was long gone by the time we got involved with the property. Uh, by the time we got there, the porch had been taken off and, and just four by fours put up in their place. And inside, uh, the house was being used for storing tobacco, uh, which is not exactly a good adaptive use of a historic house. Uh, but incredibly fine woodwork in this, what comes off as a very simple house. You put the, the, the dormers back on and, and uh, or put the shutters back on and put the porch back to its original configuration. Pretty, pretty sweet tripartite house, three-part house. Uh, you go into a central hall, and there's a room straight ahead of you, and it's room to your left and to your right. So the hallway is right there at the, the front door and uh, creating a hallway across the front of the house. Uh, but the woodwork is splendid. One of the things that's been interesting to me over my little time, <laughs> my time with Preservation North Carolina is trying to learn more about the craftsmen who are building these houses and or, and or uh, carving the mantles, et cetera. And, and for the most part, for houses like Shady Oaks, they would have been enslaved craftsmen. Uh, and for the most part, they are taking a drawing in a book and taking it and converting it into their own. So you end up with 
many variations of the same theme. I mean, this, this theme with the, the sunburst in the center and the sunburst on each of the, the side panels is very common. But this particular sunburst uh, sort of looks like they left out the sun too long and it looks like it's melted. Most of them radiate out. And this one kind of ha has this kind of weeping willow effect. And then I've kind of joked through the years that the, the ones on the side panels look like the Carolina Hurricanes uh, logo. Um, would be very interesting to know who uh, built this and maybe someday research will, will come up with that. Also of interest is to the, you can best see on the right of the mantle is an urn with a vine that goes up. I'll show you another slide uh, in a little bit that's got another variation of that theme. Uh, fascinating and fascinating connection as we find out as this goes along. Uh, and there's the, the stair now. Uh, As is the case with Patty Person Taylor House, as is the case with Shady Oaks, as is the case with Bingham School, and pretty much everything I'm going to show you. Our role in the property is a very momentary role. Um, you know, for example, with Shady Oaks, the, the house is, uh, let's see, man, 200 and 10 years old approximately, 208 years old, and we owned it for about five or six minutes. But those five or six minutes was the attempt to get it back on a, a path uh, so that it would survive. And so we, we did many a house that looked like Patty Person Taylor House, um, which from the outside, you you know, you might or might not give it a second look. It looks like a, a farmhouse that's in rough shape. Um, Certainly not an original porch or original wing out on the side, but my goodness, it's uh, quite an amazing house. But it was in, in, in rough condition in one sense, but a lot of the houses that we were, have worked with are fine structurally. It's mainly systems and cosmetics that you're, you're dealing with. Certainly you need to make sure the roof is good. Certainly you need to make sure foundations can be fine. Usually though, those are not the problems. Uh, often the additions are the problems and they have to be taken off because they are not built as well as the house themselves. And then you get inside and wood like work like this. Now, this wood would have been stripped probably a hundred years ago. Uh, it, you know, stripping wood was uh, even a, a popular thing as I was coming along in my, you know, with my first house, but a lot of wood was not intended to be uh, natural but and this has subsequently been painted but my what a beautiful beautiful mantle dating from about the just before the turn of the uh, 19th century so it's about 220 230 years old um, home of Patty Person Taylor who was the sister of General uh, William Person uh, who was a Revolutionary War general and he died at this house so statewide significance on this for all sorts of reasons. Uh, it got renovated uh, beautifully by you know, a young couple that, um, that, you know, that was 40 years ago. Uh, so you do the math on that. They did a splendid renovation. Southern Living did a very nice uh, um, article about their work. They were meticulous as could be, for example, they did paint research and, and repainted the interior uh, woodwork as, in its original colors. Um, and the woodwork, my goodness, it's beautiful. Uh, Georgian style. Again, it would be very cool to know who the craftsmen are that are building or that are, that are carving this mantle. Incredibly detailed, especially when you consider every piece of this mantle would be hand carved. Um, and it's kind of interesting to look at a map and see where there are similar mantles, uh, kind of giving you an idea of, hmm, this, somebody is working in Warren County and they're going over to Granville County and they may have done something in Halifax County and you can see the, 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 the trail sometimes of what probably was a very, very uh, highly skilled enslaved craftsmen. Not always enslaved, but usually. By the way, 
doing this webinar like this is kind of weird. It's kind of like I've been teaching, was teaching a class at Chapel Hill, and of course we had to go online at the um, uh, at spring break. And the first class out, it was kind of like this is very weird when you're not getting feedback, so you have to kind of keep going. And I look forward to seeing y'all and getting to questions. Now, Patty Person Taylor House. Um, Interestingly, we had to re-engage ourselves with this house. Um, that, that five minutes back in 1979 or 1980, on one hand, wasn't good enough, and yet it was really important because we did put the preservation covenants in place, which allowed us to go back in, with a, in when we found there was a problem and we actually did a friendly suit uh, to solve the problem. And in a matter of probably a week or so, this house will be back in, uh, in, in new ownership by somebody who loves it. The house is sitting vacant, vacant houses anywhere, but vacant houses in rural North Carolina are apt to lose their, their copper wiring and their HVAC, um, um, lines and stuff like that. And fortunately, uh, only one door was kicked in of the original fabric of the house. The rest of us there, we are really anxiously awaiting the court system transferring the house into the uh, hands of a new owner. Uh, and that should be happening pretty shortly. It was kind of funny, I, was, I wanted to show Woodleaf Plantation because we just got new photographs from the Capital City Camera Club. Capital City Camera Club has done an incredible amount of photography for us. And every time their photographs come in, it's kind of like, holy cow, they're so cool. And you see details that you never saw before, and you see you know, broad pictures that you never saw before. It's been a real treat to have them. Um, and so we got new photographs from Capital City Camera, Camera Club for Woodleaf Plantation, and I went back and I could not for the life of me find a good before photograph of the front of the house. And this is the best photograph that I could find of, of it before uh, we, we took on it until we acquired the property and sold it to the, the first buyer. Um, but you can see why I don't have any good before photographs of this house. That would be called Kutsu. Uh, there's the one side of the house from the back uh, and there's the other side. Um, you would be surprised that this house made it to the cover of Southern Living, and it did. Uh, and this is the before photograph when Bill and Sue Lord bought the property. Um, one of the very interesting things about this property is that uh, Nicholas Massenberg, who the owner of the property, kept very detailed records of his farm and the construction of this house. Very detailed records in terms of uh, where the materials were coming from, the, which slaves were working on the house, which slaves were working on the plantation. Um, well, this house was being built as the Raleigh, Raleigh and Weldon Railroad was being built. And so at some points they were going to this station to pick up supplies. And as the railroad was being extended, then they'd get to go to that station, which was near to the house. And then as the railroad was being extended, they go to the next station to pick up supplies. So it's a real interesting statement of, of North Carolina's growth that's wrapped up in this house and the, the, what we know. Hope someday we find some bright master student or PhD student who will uh, dig into these records and, and get to know this house a lot better. So it was bees that were instrumental in this house being built by, or bought by the Lord. We were going to sell the house to someone else, so someone who was coming from Phoenix area, wanted to come back to family roots in North Carolina. She looked at this house with her, she had two uh, younger sons, and this house, all of these houses have complications. Oh, always do, always do. This particular house had a complication because they moved the road further away from the house, but did not go back in and uh, 
changed the front property line. So the property owner across the street actually owned about 10 feet of property on our side of the, the road, which had to get, you know, so you had to negotiate the sale of an additional little, you know, little uh, sliver of land. And, you know, there was that complication and so forth. And then there was the complication of the bees. And so we, we found, you know, we were coming out of winter and suddenly there are bees and bees and bees and bees. And it ends up that one wall of the house is just full of beehives. So we, you know, rummaged around, you know, a local contact helped us out and identified a, a beekeeper who's the uh, Franklin County Extension agent. And he comes and gets the bees and, oh, by the way, buys the house. So great, great end result. Thank you to the bees. And they still keep bees, but they're outside, not inside the wall. Uh, there's the house now. Looks great. Still not the easiest house to photograph from the outside because it had, or from the front. And there's the, the view of it from the side that Southern Living used uh, when uh, they featured this house with some others. Um, Actually, the house is built in two parts, a uh, fascinating uh, combination of earlier and more Greek revival mantles. And great outbuildings, been beautifully cared for. And most recently, uh, Bill's decided he's going to start work on the cotton chat on the property. So uh, a, a wonderful place right outside of Lewisburg. So what did the, the person, the, the lady from Phoenix buy this house? Which also is complicated, of course. Um, the Polly Wright House, another Franklin County house. Franklin County, I mean, just north of Raleigh. Uh, Lewisburg's the county seat, but these properties are, you know, in Kittrell and Centerville and all these big mecca, meccas that you all, I'm sure, are very familiar with. Um, this is the Polly Wright House, again, a 1930s photograph by Francis Benjamin Johnston. This was the photograph of it from 1979. Uh, it's kind of like, and you thought the bees were problems. Um, but they, uh, she, and, she still lives there, and um, she and her son's a, a splendid renovation of the house. Uh, fascinating interior, kind of late Georgian woodwork. Another early property that we worked with was Clarendon Hall uh, in Yanceyville. It sits kind of back and beside the courthouse. Um, it was being used really, um, we would now call them hoarders. Um, you know, pack rats might have been a, 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 a name for them. Somebody bought antiques and but never could sell them and packed them in and packed them in and packed them in, boarded it up. The house was actually in pretty good shape, but you couldn't get any photographs of it. This is the case where, man, I wish we'd been working with the camera club 40 years earlier because we don't have decent before photographs of this house because it was just completely dark inside and packed uh, with, um, you know, furniture. Some of which was valuable, but it was much of which was not. Um, this was bought uh, by a, a fascinating couple, Ben and Margaret Williams out of, of Raleigh, uh, both of whom had uh, lifetime careers in the arts, uh, and they, they just did incredible work on this house. Ben took the uh, paint, got the paint off of the, uh, did very, carefully getting new paint off the mantles um, and exposing the marbleizing and the gilding and then he, he, he uh, so to speak, uh, restored it, brushed it up a bit. One of the things interesting to look at is this, the shape of this mantle with a kind of the, almost like a little pedimented shape over the, the top of the mantle. We now know that this, this property uh, has Thomas Day woodwork, um, it would have been when Thomas Day, free black cabinet maker, and you'll see more about his work in a little bit. Thomas Day would have been young, 
and going straight out of the uh, pattern books, mainly Owen Biddle, if my memory serves me right, um, or Asher Benjamin, it was Asher Benjamin. This is, and um, these are, are pretty much standard out of the book mantles. Um, you know, and you see this, this kind of curve in here. Um, and you, again, you got the pedimented back. Uh, this is almost straight out of the pattern book. I'll show you another example from another house in a little bit. Um, beautiful detailing on the stair, beautifully caught in the photography by the camera club. Here's another Franklin County house. I'd gone over to Yanceville, coming back over to Franklin County. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about this house is this house almost didn't make it because of drug deals. Um, and we, we've been involved with our fair share of properties with those kinds of problems. Uh, you know, the, the house gets condemned because of drug deals. House is actually okay in terms of conditions. Um, beautifully renovated once that porch is taken off. A really exquisite property. Hey, Myra, it's Clarissa. Yes. I, sorry to interrupt. We just had one comment. If you could just slow down a little bit on the afters. I think folks are super excited about the after photos. I'll try my best. Okay. I'm always kind of doing that. Oh, my God, I got to get through it. Got to get through it. Yes. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. So here's a house that we had for sale in Lexington. Um, and the house... Looks like a run, you know, typical in a sense, early 20th century house, Victorian porch, classical revival, uh, pedimented front on it. Um, sitting between, at that point, it was an Amoco station on one side and a Firestone dealership on the other side, on Main Street, 400 block of Main Street, still owned by a descendant of the original builder. Uh, William Rainey Holt. Um, and yet there was this photograph of the house, which showed incredible detail. At this point, painted up in Victorian colors. But let's go back. Um, and you can see on this, the, um, the you know, to, to try to put shutters on these triple windows, they had done these little bee skinny shutters out on the side. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard to tell the shutters from the windows. Uh, the, the, the downstairs um, arched windows, Palladian windows don't even show up under the porch. So I found a buyer who was wanting to take it back to look at this. Now, yeah, from preservation standpoint, you're generally saying that the changes to a house are part of the evolution of the house. Um, in this case, for one, the, the front porch was in pretty ragged shape, as a lot of front porches of that size are, uh, when it hadn't been repaired in a long time. And the other thing is you had this incredible material there that you couldn't even see. So we, we, uh, we said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and he worked with a restoration architect who, uh, who actually had uh, previous work for the State of Historic Preservation Office. Uh, to restore it back to its original configuration. Beautiful Greek Revival house. Uh, look at these wonderful corner boards that, that uh, represent columns as if they're you know, two-story columns on the edge and these gorgeous Palladian windows on the first floor. And there you have it in a little uh, closer up and the detailing around the door uh, is you know, straight out of the Asher Benjamin pattern book. And then you go inside. Over up on the right, there's a, I uh, couldn't get a better resolution on this, uh, is, a, is one of the drawings out of the pattern book. And there's the mantle that uh, is, is clearly just straight out of the pattern book from the 1830s. Um, Going back up to Yanceyville, uh, we work with the Sally Martin house. You know, let's see, what's wrong with this house? You know, see when it's got no trespassing sign on the porch, you know, 
mattress on the porch, asbestos siding, uh, and believe it or not, this is what's underneath all that. Uh, one of the things very interesting about this particular house is it's an earlier house, but they updated it to add a, a Thomas Day mantle to this house. And again, we found a wonderful buyer who took beautiful care of it and, and exposed the, uh, the marbleizing on this, this Thomas Day mantle. Very large mantle for this very little house, but clearly they were uh, striving to be up to date. Uh, about 20 years after the house was built. We, we're not just early houses. Actually, we've, we've done our fair share of medicine free modern. I'm really proud of that. You're not going to see any of that today um, for no good reason other than you know, we're just kind of pulling photographs and things that have interesting stories. This is a case where we had to wait for a funeral. Um, it happens. Sometimes that is the case of where the owners just not wanting to sell granddaddy's house or great granddaddy's house and the house is coming down uh, in pieces uh, during that time. Um, one of my favorite photographs um, of, a, of an outhouse. Um, the, the, as charming as it is in this condition, fortunately it's not in this condition anymore. Uh, we've had great owners with that house who've done a beautiful renovation. Interestingly, for those of you who are fans of Jacob Holt, this is one of his few, how, the few houses he did after the Civil War where, where the Victorian style is coming in stronger. Uh, it's, it, this time it's more Victorian, but when you kind of look at it, it's, it's right back to his, uh, what he was doing with the, the Greek Revival and Italian houses he's doing in Warren County. There's the outbuilding uh, in a face or way. It's glamorous when it's falling over, but it's also very cool uh, now back, uh, back in good shape. Oh, we hate moving houses. Oh, do we hate moving houses? But it, I mean, sometimes you gotta do it. Uh, this is Piney Prospect in Edgecombe County. We didn't actually move this one ourselves. We sold it to someone who moved it. We worked with them in terms of finding a piece of land to move it to. That was still, this is an Edgecombe County Tar River house. We, and finding a piece of land not far away where it could be moved and, and retain its, its integrity from that standpoint. Interesting thing is it's, like, it's basically a Charleston-like house with this enclose the port the porch that has the wind at the end of the porch uh, which is, is fascinating um, details are amazing um, you'll get to see another after this um, but the details on this are kind of splendid and and you really have to get up close to it and take a really careful look at it and they're they're very individualistic. Uh, clearly someone is putting their mark on this property, uh, on this mantle, in a, in a way that's very specific to their, their building. And again, Camera Club, Capital C Camera Club did these photographs and they're splendid. And how's that for detail? And it's interesting that the, the detail that are uh, that's coming up on the, the side of the porch is really has this kind of curious, uh, almost um, it, it's not high style. It's, it, it, um, and, and yet you have the very high style detailing along the, the, the cornice. And here again, beautiful stair treads, but almost primitive uh, in terms of the, the, the carvings. But, but fascinating, again, I hope someday we'll find out who did this work and be able to bring that person or those persons back into the, the, into the light of, of showing off their artistry uh, with their name attached. Making some progress in it.
front. And here's the house uh, on its on its new site. Um, and again, beautifully restored, wonderful owners. This is a house that we moved um, back a, a few years ago. Uh, was uh, on on Old Wake Forest Road uh, across the street from um, Trader Joe's. Had to be moved for a big apartment complex. Land sold for seven million dollars. Um, kind of hard to challenge that. So we got the developer to give us three hundred thousand toward the move. Which between between hindsight, maybe we should have asked for four hundred thousand, but. Um, the, the move itself was, we moved it um, on, only a, a, about 700 feet um, and it, the cost of the move, the move itself was about $160,000, foundation about 40000 Then there was the prep of the house before the move and then the kind of putting it back together, so to speak, uh, after the move, but it was all moved in one piece. We did um, We didn't know when the house was built, but we, we had dendrochronology done on the house. That's where you, they look at the tree rings to determine the age of the house. Um, you know, if 1789 was a dry year, the ring's gonna be narrow. In 1790, there's a wet year, the ring, ring will be wide. And by setting up a database of, of how year those years relate to each other, uh, the scientists can come in, take a wood cor core boring, and determine how old the house is. And we found that the house was built, I think, it was about 1911, 1912, 1811, 1812. Excuse me. Um, it now has a new porch. I don't have a photograph of it with its new porch. Was splendid interior, simple and yet very elegant. Um, and our buyers uh, are wonderful. And Matt Hobbs, who uh, is the owner, is on our board now. Um, again, I'm showing you a lot of early stuff, and part of that's because. It, the, the, to me, the photography is fascinating. Each house is so individually interesting versus, um, you know, more more recent houses that have the the uh, the mantles that were machine made and although interesting, cranked out, they were cranked out by the by the thousands. Um, hey, Mark. Yes. Sorry, yes. Before yes. we got too far past it, somebody did ask um, in the chat, "What was the outhouse used for um, now after the res uh, restoration?" Sorry, I know we passed that <laughs> a minute ago. I Maybe wait. the fire truck's the right answer. Um, I don't know whether they um, refurbished the use of it as an outhouse per se, but I think they probably restored the interior of it as it was. I mean, we, we have down at the Bellamy Mansion, um, you know, two privies that are, that I think they're five holders each. Um, we do not encourage their use, um, but, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting look at American, uh, at American architecture. But the answer to that is I really don't, I'm really not sure. So, sorry. Um, going over Chapel Hill, uh, Edward Kidder Graham House. Uh, this is a documentary photograph. Um, very important because two of the residents of that house became presidents of the University of North Carolina. One of them became a U.S. Senator. Uh, in terms of the these particular five young men, the one the center is Edward Kidder Graham, who by that point's a uh, professor and becomes president of the university later. Uh, 
but all, all, all five of these had quite remarkable careers, including Frank Porter Graham, uh, who is the nephew. Uh, but the house got into bad shape, bad shape. Um, and this is a case where we had to get an option on the house, buy it for about 900,000. Yes, we had to buy that house for about 900,000. Uh, we figured out how a lot could be divided off with doing no harm to the house. Uh, it took a drive off of one street and the, the lot being on another street. Um, and find a buyer who would use the tax credits to, to do the renovation and they've done a splendid re renovation of the house. And they, they love the house, they're, they're great university fans. So they um, take great pride in, the, in the, the heritage of this house. Another one that we've just got some new photographs of, Thomas Day House. Um, Thomas Day was a free black cabinet maker in Milton. Uh, fascinating life, we didn't know much about him. Um, you can see when this state highway marker was done, we weren't even sure when he was born or at that point where he was born. Um, the house suffered a very bad fire. Um, don't rake leaves, don't burn leaves on a windy day is the moral of the story. Uh, the previous owner was doing that, the leaves blew up under the house and the house just took off. There it is today, in fact, very recently. Um, earlier house, Thomas Day bought it. Um, Thomas Day, it's interesting, Thomas Day uh, was interacted almost socially with the, uh, the his white constituents, uh, white customers, um, went to the same church, uh, and uh, he had a daughter who went to Salem College. Uh, and he's really kind of the first person who is doing furniture in North Carolina using steam powered equipment. So was, he's moving into the industrial revolution. Local group bought it from us. We helped organize the group um, and they have restored it as a, a place in, in memory of, of Thomas Day. Uh, there's still work going on, still work to be done. Here's the back of the property and we're the only people around who would buy something like that. Uh, you know, but it was way too important to let it go. Uh, here it is today. So it was fascinating to watch uh, and to be involved in the in the stabilization of this property. What you see on the end, the what it looks like utility poles had to put utility poles all the way around the brick structure, tie the brick structure to the utility poles, and and tie across the the fire the opening. So because you, you do not want your your crafts your your contractors to um, be injured, but they we tethered them in from lines between the utility poles. So they were they were um, it was a very difficult process of cleaning out uh, the the damaged wood and trying to save what could be saved. Uh, among the things that could be saved are some of the mantles that were up against the wall and survived the fire. A uh, very nice federal mantle. Um, this mantle reminds me of Shady Oaks with the, here's, here's the vine coming up the, the uh, side of each side of the, the mantle and some fascinating carving. You can see the, the fire damage on that. And here's a Thomas Day mantle. Uh, one of the things that he often did in his later work were these curved linear fronts of the mantles going to a flat tablet. So you, you can get it that this is curved, this is curved, and then the, 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 the bulging columns uh, are things that he did. Interesting that the Thomas, I'm a great believer that if you keep the buildings, then the, then the, um, the stories go along with them. You can't keep the stories. And Thomas Day is such a fascinating story and it's looking entirely possible that this may become a state historic site. 
which would be great because it tells it allows you to tell a very complicated story about race in North Carolina. Um, Thomas Day is a um, is viewed as African American, but three of his four grandparents are white, as we now know. Um, the the lines are so blurred in so many ways, which kind of shows that race is is a modern construct and and pretty much an artificial. Um, barrier between people. Day is doing very individualistic work. Um, he starts out doing pattern work and, and before it's over with, he's doing some very creative, fascinating work. Um, if you look at this long enough, you will see his initials, TD. Um, fascinating. It, it looks like it could have been done in 1950 in Swedish modern. It's beautiful work. And we were involved with uh, doing a book with the North Carolina Museum of History about Day's furniture and his uh, woodwork, architectural woodwork. I'm gonna do about one more thing and then call it, call it quits and move on to see if you know, see what questions y'all have. You know, a lot of the properties we work with just, again, I say that we're, we may be in there for only five minutes. We, we might work 10 years to get to that five minutes. And this is one, um, Elmwood in Granville County. We worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Um, the owners had visions that the land was gonna be uh, a golf course, um, kind of hard to pay, pay golf course prices for hundreds of acres of land because there's a house back in the center of it. Meantime, the house is just completely falling apart. Ends up that the woodwork was taken out of the house and was going to be put into the, a house in Chapel Hill. And we thought, hmm, Elmwood, that, that, that's pretty much the death knell for Elmwood. But lo and behold, the woodwork got stolen. And we helped track down the woodwork. We had a clue of who might have stolen the woodwork. We got some investigation done, and uh, we got the woodwork returned on a Saturday morning down at the end of a dirt road under a tarp. Um, the, the person who can build the house in Chapel Hill by then had given up on it and just gave us the woodwork. The value of the woodwork was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, beautifully carved uh, early 19th century woodwork. And he's tripping down railings. And there's what the, so we advertised the house. We got the woodwork work back for the house. It was installed, paint was first done. Um, and it's, it, it's fascinating. Kind of take a look at this in terms of the colors and the, the, the mantle. This is in Granville County outside of Oxford. Uh, check out that mantle and then let's go back to Patty Person Taylor House, which is maybe 30 miles away. And you really do have to wonder. I mean, the colors in both houses are based on paint research. Um, you really have to wonder if perhaps they are the same. Done a fair share of, you know. 19th or 20th century houses, you know, uh, by the hundreds, literally. Um, this is Durham. Uh, we've done school buildings by the dozens, and most of them have ended up as affordable housing, beautifully adapted. This is in Cramerton outside of Gastonia. We've worked in neighborhoods. I'm not going to show you much, but just say that we've done it. Here's an East Durham where we did, we did seven houses, we renovated seven houses and sold them, uh, all vacant houses. We actually bought, uh, actually some of these were donated to us by Habitat and that tells you what kind of condition they were in. Uh, we've made a real point of working with industrial properties. I love this one back in Jamestown early, uh, built in the 1830s as a gold mill for milling the gold ore mined nearby by Welch uh, 
engineer. And one of the most interesting things is to look at his building in North Carolina and compare them to the buildings that were built in Wales for the coal mining industry. Um, so clearly he is bringing his own um, native uh, architecture with him. Done mill villages. I wanted to talk about this later. I want to talk about industrial buildings and mill villages. We work with Needington, 57 houses plus the mill, all renovated, plus infill. Glencoe, uh, more than 30 houses. This was one of my favorite, the leaner. It had fallen off its foundation. We lifted it back up and sold it. Uh, and it was beautifully renovated. There's a before Glencoe and an after Glencoe. Mill Village was vacant for nearly 50 years. Um, Larry Mill, Gastonia, a very famous 1929 strike. Huge structure, two acres of roof, six stories tall. Got a great article in the New York Times on that one. And I think that that might be a good place for me to stop. I was going to show you one more thing, but I think we probably have. I'll, I'll do it on another go round if y'all are interested in doing more. So, Clarissa, yeah. do your magic. Yes. Hmm? Trying to get my, ah, I was trying to get my face up again. So, um, yeah, we're officially open for questions. I have, I see uh, there's one in the chat that I wanted to acknowledge um, from uh, Juliana Rose. Um, and she was wondering what the boxes are on top. I'm not sure which house that is because she sent it a little while ago. I'm going to click on um, a Piney, Pros uh, Piney Prospect, Myrick. What are the mm -hmm. boxes that were on top? Um, You can see there are a lot of slides I didn't use. <laughs> oh, a lot of slides I didn't use. Okay, Piney Prospect is. Uh, is the detail right under uh, Eve. The that details under the, that. Those details is that what? Yes. The person is asking for, about. Yes. That's a that is a Greek detail that was on Greek temples, um, and. It's just a decorative detail, and then along with those details, there are these little bands here of, that are carved that are, um, again, Greek detailing, part of Greek revival detailing. I mean, I do find this is so interesting. It's kind of like, here's the, here's the primitive version, and here's the fancy Greek version, just seen side by side. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Uh, but that's, that's just Greek detailing. If you go to the North Carolina State Capitol, you will see that. I'll uh, refer to it as pegged medallions, if my memory serves me right, but I am not, I am not, I am not an architectural historian. But All if right. you look up pegged modillions, I think you will find that. Uh, Kathleen said uh, metopes. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Question mark, M-E-T-O-P-E-S. Okay. So, I don't. <laughs> um, so we have a question. Um, do you think that tax credits, financial help for people to restore historic homes, is going to be affected by the economic effects of COVID on state governments? Woo. Um, I, I wish I could answer that well. Um, the. Um, and go over back over here and set this guy up just for the fun of it. Um, you know, we've been able to we've been able to keep these credits in place. So they actually first started in '93. The federal credits started in '90 or '76, and the North Carolina credits started in '93. But it's really '98 that they got to where they are now. Um. I hope that we'll be able to keep them. They, the residential credit's not nearly as strong as it used to be. Um, I hope some point we will be able to get that back 
in a stronger place. Uh, we're going to have to work on it in the next session of the General Assembly to make sure we have it extended before the next date that it runs out. All right. Let's say COVID is going to make a mess for local government and state government and federal government too in terms of um, yeah, the economy and, and unemployment and medical costs and all of the above. So we'll see. Uh, we have another question from um, Terry Matern. And I need to add gutters. I know they should be U-shaped. The new roof is barn red, metal standing seam. What color gutter should I use? My property is in Glen Choga Lodge in Topton, North Carolina. Um, <laughs> it, I'm probably the wrong person to answer the question and probably would take looking at the, the, the building, but I'd be sort of inclined to paint them the same color as the, the cornice trim. Um, the, the, um, as in if your your corner if your wood detailing along the roof line is white or off white I'd be inclined to use that color or whatever color that is you don't particularly want your gutters to stand out as a you'd rather have them really disappear to the extent you can Yeah. Um, Tara said the, the house is saddle notch and very primitive compared to what I saw today. Hmm. We, 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 we have done our, we have done our share of, um, uh, yeah. Let me catch you today. I'm glad you can't get this. We, you know, I, I, I we had for, re, we had for a reason to do a little bit of, looking, we have approximately 200,000 photographs of well over a thousand properties. And I could do a variation of the show weekly for the next two years and probably not show um, and not repeat it. Uh, and you could do different themes. Today, I really kind of stuck with photographs uh, recent photographs that we've gotten that I'm excited about the photographs so, and they show the properties and their interesting stories with them. We've done our fair share of smaller properties, lock structures, uh, mill houses, etc. Um, you know, if the house, if your house is, is in that more primitive mode and depending on if the wood is Bare, you know, and you're thinking about what to do with the, the gutters, you could go, you know, a, a dark brown. At this point, the cost between doing them, you know, one color versus another color, color is pretty negligible. It's, it's, it's quite, you know, there are quite a wide variety of colors available. But again, generally speaking, you don't want to call attention to them. Awesome. So we are a little after five o'clock. So I'm going to do this last question. And then if folks want to come over to the after party, you can see everybody and we can continue to talk for a few minutes. Um, so this last question is from Laura Benson. Uh, hi, Myrick and Clarissa. This was fabulous. Nice job, Myrick. Hey, thank <laughs> given, you, Laura. <laughs> given there are 100 local preservation associates, associations in North Carolina, what role should, could, do you want them to play? In Buford and Carteret County, we have many at-risk properties, as you know. Now, Clarissa, where did you grow up and call it Buford? Well, I, hey, Raleigh. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Okay, okay. Just got to give you a hard time. Uh, actually, what we have, Laura, is we have over 100 commissions, which are local government review commissions. Um, and they, um, they need to stay up to date on the laws. They need to stay up. And we try to do workshops for them. We're trying to figure out how to do, we, we probably will do a 
workshop or two or three or four for them coming up in the next six months, um, you know, online because of the, the, the COVID situation. Um, in terms of, you know, there are probably only about 10 or 12 local preservation organizations that are staffed, um, professionally staffed, and, and we try to stay in touch with them. One of the things about preservation, there are so many different ways you can go about it. I've jokingly said to folks, we, you know, preservation is sort of like a cafeteria line. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of choices and you can only pick three. And so you might as well pick three that you think you can do well, that are healthy choices that do right by you. Um, and what you might do in one community is going to be very different from what you do in another community. What you do in one neighborhood is going to be different from what you do in another neighborhood. Um, I would hope that all the local groups are, are promoting the tax credits. I hope all the local groups are, um, prom are promoting uh, good preservation choices in terms of uh, renovation. Uh, and we've got some terrific people out there across the state who are very active at the local level. And of course, I've been they join Preservation North Carolina. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that does it. And I'm going to, um, if you scroll up, if you're in the chat, there's a link um, to the other Zoom meeting. And I'm going to send it again down here and um, we'll be over there and you'll be able to see everybody. Well, of course, everybody who has their uh, video turned on, um, we can continue chatting, but thank you all um, for joining us and all the comments of thanks and kudos to Mark. I'll make sure he sees those messages. <laughs> all right, thank y'all.